Hi, it's the last session of the day, the last session of the conference. So what I'm inclined to do is make this a little bit more interactive than planned to stop you all falling asleep. <laughs> um, so what I may do is pick on a few people I know in the audience to um, maybe, maybe give a bit of feedback on some of them. Um, we are videoing this, so if I do point to you and you choose not to run away, if we can get the mic to you, then um, that might help get the audio recorded and make it more useful for people watching on later. So what can possibly go wrong with, with software? Um, well, I, I kind of just did a, a Google and, and found this list here. Um, and I think actually some of these examples are fairly minor in the, the scale of IT software development and, and software development cock-ups. So if we can maybe use existing open source technology to build our software, then that would hopefully help us avoid some of these. But we can't just say, hey, let's just grab that open source project there, put it at the very core of our business, and, and hope for the best without ever checking in on, on what's going to happen with the project, what's going to go on. So I'm going to try and talk us through a few things to think about, some things to consider when deciding whether or not a, an open source project is suitable to go at the core of, of your business. Not the technical side. I'm not going to help you work out whether or not this project or this project is the technically more suitable. It's about the, the risk of the project, the license, the community, and how that will affect whether or not it's a good choice for you to put at the basis of your business and whether or not it's something that you can just use as is or whether it's a project that you're going to have to get involved in the community of if you want to make it work. So in theory, <coughs> should be seven Ps, our software. Proper planning and preparation prevents piss poor performance. That's that's the theory. So when we're when we're picking these these projects, it's about managing the risk. We can't avoid it completely. Can't just wave a magic wand and the project's suddenly perfect and it's all good to go. So what we have to do when when planning is to to think about the common risk factors, think about how much impact they'll have on the project and our use of the project and then try and work out, is it, is it feasible to, to work around those risks? What do we have to think about? What efforts should we be putting in to try and mitigate them? And then we have to repeat, because we're probably not just going to have one piece of open source software at the core of our solution. We're going to have several. And the project's going to change over time. So we can't just say, hey, this, this project here, it's great, does everything we need, it's got a great community, and we can just trust that for the next 30 years, or as Greg Stein was hoping, 50 years, that project will always be vibrant and, and open and, and welcoming and, and there. So we've had a little look at what can go wrong. I'm going to try and look at some of the risk types, how to measure them, how to evaluate them, and what we should do from there. So the first kind of risk to think about with open source projects is the legal, the license. If all of your stuff is going to be Apache, it's not so much of an issue. You should hopefully all know the, the, the license we have. But it's rare, sadly. I mean, Apache is kind of semi-all-encompassing. But sadly, we don't have all of the core cool projects in the world, just most of them. So you're probably going to have to deal with some projects that have other licenses. or in, if you're going to be looking at, at projects coming into the Apache Incubator, you're going to be dealing with projects that have different licenses, dependencies on different licenses, and that's going to affect things. And I think the, uh, the Incubator project chair is hiding at the back, so I, I may ask you to say a few things in a moment about, about licenses, because within the ASF, the big area for, for licenses and how they fit together is within the Incubator. So when you, when you get get the software and you look at the license, you need to say, you know, can, can, I, can I use this in my project to start with? Then if I make changes to the software for in-house use, is that going to be okay? What about if I want to start distributing these changes? How do I have to attribute the software? If I want to contribute to the software, what, what are the terms under which I can contribute? What are the terms under which it will be accepted? Can someone buy 
the whole project and take it away. Because um, that's a fairly big one. If you say, hey, you know, this software now, it's great. I'm going to base my business on it. And someone goes, well, you know, that software project there is causing problems for, for our huge software project. So the cheapest thing to do is to just buy the code base and close it, turn it off. Is that, is that going to be a risk for you? Um, and also, are, are there fees? With, with open source software, generally, it's free, but it does depend what you're going to be doing with it, if it's commercial, because sometimes it does make sense to, to pay for the code. Um, Benson, do you want to say a few things about licensing? Sure. Follow your structure again. So, once a project is correctly operating as a real TLP in the foundation, you know that the code of the project itself is all Apache licensed, period. The other thing you know is that the dependencies of the project are nearly Apache licensed. They might not be Apache licensed, but they have licenses which have this, that, that sort of come into the same general flavor as the Apache license. They won't impose reciprocal obligations on you. Now, if you develop an interest in something which is in mid-incubation, you may catch it while it isn't quite entirely cooked in this, in this respect. Uh, PMC, mere PMC chair that I am, I can't really tell you whether we've ever had an incubator release which still had a strict dependency on a thing which was not quite an acceptable license yet. I believe that in some cases it's been known to happen that while things are in incubation, they, re they can retain some troublesome dependencies which are worked out over time. So I guess I would say is you know what's going on if you're out of the incubator. If you're looking at something in the incubator, you probably should look twice to make sure that you're happy with the dependencies. And someone stole your chair. <laughs> <laughs> So um, another thing to think about is um, standards. Uh, uh, in many cases, especially at Apache, that the software we have either implements a standard or has sort of de, de facto defined a standard. Um, and that's important if you're going to be putting your, your, your business on top of this software or your data in the software. How easy is it going to be for you to change to something else? If, if project changes, if your needs change, can you get your, your data out? Can you change what your, your software is running on top of? So you need to think about the standards. Um, is it easy to move away? Are those standards encumbered? You know, is, is it gonna, is, are you going to have to pay a load of money just to use the standard? Um, who owns and manages the standard? Because the standard may be right for you today, but if, uh, if you can't get involved in, in how that standard develops, and what comes in in the next version, then the standard that is right for you today may not be right for you in the future. Is it easy to influence those standards? If you realize that the standard nearly does what you want that the software is going to be implementing, but not quite, can you just rock along and go, hey guys, we should, we should add this new, new feature into the standard, make it present in all of the implementations out there, or are you going to have to pay a whole load of money and they'll never talk to you anyway? So having a standard is great, but we can't just say standard tick, forget about it. We need to look a little bit more at how those standards work, how the standards bodies work, that sort of thing. Knowledge. The knowledge that underpins the software is very important. The knowledge of the community. So is it easy for your developers to get involved in the project and learn about the project? And can you add to that knowledge? Now, you might find that for a software project, it's going to be uh, running along the lines of the Apache way, and it's all fine. And you know that you can just turn up, join the list, start discussing, start asking questions. That's going to be fine. But for some other op open source projects, there's not one single list that you can join, and it may not be welcoming. You may find that there's half a dozen different lists spread around, and different websites, and forums, and mailing lists, and things. And in that case, it's going to be very hard for you to get started. If you know that you just rock up on the, the dev list and ask a question, it's all good. But if it's like, well, for that kind of thing, you've got to go to that forum over there. For that stuff, it's that mailing list there. That stuff, all that tends to be done on ILC. And if you're not online at the right time, it's going to be a problem. And that stuff there, well, we kind of have a secret cabal, and you're not allowed to join yet, so you're never going to get to find out about it. In that kind of case, it's going to be hard, and there's going to be a risk for you to get involved. 
Um, and do you have to pay for the information? Um, it is something that can sometimes crop up a bit with Apache projects where the best source of information has come from a company and maybe they'll want to charge you. Now there's nothing stopping you from then going in and learning about it and, and writing the, the better documentation and, and free documentation. But are you going to have to pay a lot of money for training and support to get up to speed? Or is it something that's going to be, be nearly free? Um, governance. Again, relatively easy and well known with Apache stuff, less so with some of the other ones. But can the project change direction without your kind of knowledge and, and without you having a say in it? So if the project's moving along and, and it's, it's, it's suiting you, and then it makes a dramatic shift, yes, you might be able to fork the code and carry on the other way, but then you've got to maintain the whole of the product, you've got to maintain all the security fixes, backporting, everything like that. Whereas if the product is, and, and project's quite open, then you can, you can influence it and steer it. Um, is it possible for your, your interest to be blocked by other parties? If there's one company that dominates a project and you want to do something that's going to influence their bottom line, there's a reasonable chance that they'll, they'll block you and stop you. Not an issue with Apache, it is an issue with a lot of other stuff. And can you get your contributions in? Let's say there's a, there's a feature missing and you spend some time and you implement it. Can you actually get that contribution back into the project? Or are you going to be stuck maintaining your own little vendor branch? And is it stable? If the governance is great today but keeps changing and there's a benevolent dictator and then they're overthrown and a new benevolent dictator, things are going to keep changing and, and moving all over the place. And that will affect the stability and the, the, the longevity of the project. <clears throat> and then what's the market like? Are there multiple suppliers? Are there multiple companies you can go to if you need support, if you need new features adding, if you, if you want to get involved? And can you get involved in that market? You know, if you spend a lot of time working on the product, on the project, building up the skill set of yourself and your team, is it possible for you to then sell some services off the back of that? Or are you going to be restricted by the, the main company involved? So those are our main kind of risks to think about. We've got the legal, the standards base, the knowledge, the governance, uh, and the market. So we've got to think about all of those when evaluating. They're measuring. Um, I've mentioned the Apache projects a few times. If you've got the Apache projects, it's relatively clear about the risk. If it's in labs, it's going to be high risk. There are quite a few projects that go into labs, very few that come out as fully formed communities going on into the incubator or going on into TLPs. A lot of stuff in labs is experimental and most of it won't really come to much beyond an idea that was either shown to not work or need redoing in another project. So betting your business on something that's in labs is probably not going to be a, a, a great idea. The incubator is bringing things in to the foundation. Things in the incubator are not yet fully working according to the Apache way. So if you want to base your business on something in the incubator, you need to do a little bit of investigating. The board reports from all the incubator projects are public, they're on the wiki, and the board reports always have a, a few sections in there talking about the risks to the project and the things blocking graduation. So if you're interested in an incubator project and you're new to it, you can go and have a look through those board reports and say, hey, this project here, it's only got one company in it, community is quite small and go well okay if we want to get involved we know that we're going to need to bring more people to the party and get involved or you look at it and it says you know this is this project's almost ready to graduate they just need to get one more release out you can say hey this is probably going to be fine but you need to do a little bit of looking and seeing how the community is is behaving how everything's progressing if it's a top level project it should be fine the risks should be being managed. It should be an open, welcoming, community-driven, multiple companies, all that kind of thing. Um, but it is worth checking the sort of the um, how active the project is. So, project would come in through the incubator, 
become a top level project, be the, the current hip thing, everyone's involved, everyone's interested. But then eventually after a few years, some of our projects become less exciting. Fewer people involved in them, fewer new features, it just kind of works. And you need to look because eventually a project will end up in the attic when the community has fizzled away and there's no one left to support it, it goes to the attic. So if it's a very long-lived top-level project, it's worth kind of checking the board reports again, seeing how vibrant the community is, and then trying to think forward. You know, if, it's, if the community is vibrant now, you should be fine for a few years. If the community is struggling to get enough interest and oversight for new features and new, uh, and new releases, then you need to say, well, it'll be fine now, but it does it risk going into the attic in, in nine months' time, two years' time? Um, <clears throat> what does the incubator do? Uh, I've said a little bit about it, um, but I think it'd probably be best if we can drag Benson back up. I think you gave a whole talk on it, so if you can condense that whole talk down to about mm, three minutes. Sure. Well, I think, I'll, however, I will face you if I'm going to have to talk at this length, even at, in short. So, the incubator is a bootstrapping device. We all think we know what a healthy Apache project looks like. It has an open community. It makes decisions on mailing lists. It brings in properly vetted IP that can be Apache licensed, and it makes releases of that. But people are not born, at least most people are not born, knowing how to do that. And so the foundation set out to find a way in which to facilitate projects learning how to do this, and that's the incubator. So in the incubator, a small, potentially very small group of people join the incubator, they're given permission to use Apache infrastructure, they're supervised by Apache Foundation members and others who are who join the incubator PMC, and they operate under supervision. And the goal of the incubator is for them to act as much like a TLP as fast as possible, and when we can't tell the difference anymore, we kick them out and they graduate. Are there any, should we, we let them ask questions about yes. this? Yes, right. definitely. Are there questions about that process? Are you all awake? Hands up if you're still awake. <laughs> Hey. All right, so they're legitimately fresh out of questions. I'll go away again. <laughs> so, if it's an Apache project, we, we've got an idea of, of the risk and the, the problems we might face. A little bit about the incubator. So what if it's not an Apache project? Um, there, there are various tools out there you can, you can use and you can evaluate against. Um, the openness rating is one of them that tries to classify the development model of a, of a project and, and come out with some answers. And what we're aiming for in all of this is to try and work out what the potential risks are, how big they're going to be, and can we mitigate against them. We're not going to get a number out that says, this project is 27, and it's all good. You're going to get a sense of, of what's going on. Um, but it's only part of the whole planning and life cycle. So you can't just look at the, the, the project risk in isolation. You've got to think about how it's going to fit into your whole um, software development life cycle and everything like that. So um, evaluating openness. More open projects are generally more flexible for you, more easy for you to get involved, more easy for you to make changes to it. So that's why we're interested in kind of how open is this. So it, when you try and evaluate that, you've got to think about the, the license, the standards, the knowledge, the governance, the market, those risks that we've looked at before. And then you have to decide for yourself, what is your risk profile? If you're trying to build something that's going to run for 20 years, where it's very, very expensive for you to make changes to it, that's going to be a very different risk profile to if you do continuous deployment and make changes to your live system three times a day and you can pivot really easily. So there is no one single answer, but you have to think about it. Think about your needs, think about your business, what's going on, and then from that, do the evaluation and work out if it's going to be a good fit or not. So, um, when thinking about the license, you know, what kind of license is it? Is it a permissive license? Is it, um, is it one with a lot of restrictions on it? Is it one which requires that you contribute changes back? 
Is it one where you can take your toys and go home? What kind of IP due diligence goes on? It's important. You may have a piece of software with a license that says, yep, you can, you can do what you want with this, it's going to be fine. But if all of the code in there has come from other places with other licenses, then it's not actually under the license you thought it was under. So if it's a project that takes the IP due diligence seriously, as all the projects at Apache should do, you can look at it and go, this is Apache licensed, and I know that it's properly Apache licensed, and I know that everyone who contributed to it was aware of the license and agreed to it, it's all good. If it's a project that doesn't take it so seriously, then you might have problems. Um, and what's the, the traceability like? Where, where did this code come from? You know, how did it get to be there today? So you need to look at those. If it's Apache, generally fine. If it's not Apache, then you have to think a bit more. Standards, um, have, we got, have we got, is it compliant with standards? Are they open standards? Um, are there patterns involved? It's, it's all very well having a piece of open source software implementing a standard, but if there's a whole load of patents that apply to that standard, then you're going to be very restricted in what you can do, and you're probably going to have to pay a load of money for patent licenses. Um, depending on the license that the software is under, some licenses come with patent grants that will protect you from other companies involved in the project exerting any patents they have against you, but that won't help if the patents are owned by companies that are not part of that project, not part of their space. There are other licenses out there with no patent <coughs> grants that don't say anything about patents. And in that case, you can find that another company that's contributing to the project can have a patent and then can demand money from you for licensing that patent, even though they may have given you the software for free. If the license doesn't have any patent grants, then there's a chance that they can still come after you for money for the patent, if not for the software. The knowledge. <coughs> you know, how easy is it for you to find out about this project? How easy is it for your developers to learn about it, to contribute back? You know, what level of support is there available? When you first start on a project, there's a lot to learn. Some cases, you're going to want to say, it's fine, we're going to budget two weeks, we're all going to read some of the tutorials, watch some of the video casts, that kind of thing, and get involved. Or you might say, hey, we, we need it yesterday, so what I'm going to need to do is find someone who can provide training, support. Is that available? So that's going to depend on the kind of company you've got, the kind of problems you've got, the timescales you're working to. And Maybe it's going to be an issue if there's no one providing support. Maybe, maybe it will be, but that will depend on the kind of company you are. Um, talked a bit about the governance al already, but a few things that you should be looking at when evaluating, you know, what's the structure? Um, what succession planning is there? If there's a project with a benevolent dictator for life and something happens to that benevolent dictator, what's going to happen is the project going to splinter into lots of pieces? Is it going to hold together? If it's a project where the leadership changes quite often, without a lot of controversy, then it's probably going to be fine when leaders change. If it's a community where leader changes are very controversial, then you've got to worry about what's going to happen to the community during that change. You know, are you going to lose a lot of community members if a leadership change happens and people get upset? Um, what kind of codes of behavior, codes of conduct exist in a project? Is it a kind of project that's going to be where people are going to be well behaved and welcoming of new people? So when you turn up and say, hey, um, we're, we're going to be using this project and there's three of us here who are going to be contributing, uh, taking part in the community, are you going to be welcomed or are you going to face a torrent of, of abuse and, and all that kind of thing? That's going to affect your ability to get involved. And is it transparent? You know, if you start asking these questions and you can't find any of the answers, that's probably not going to be a good sign about the, the, the project and its governance and how easy it for you to get involved. If you turn up and say, oh, I've got some questions about how the project's been going, and they say, well, you know, here's, here's the archives, go and have a read through, see how we made all the decisions, 
see how um, we came to those ideas, see, see how we've been evaluating ourselves, you have a different level of confidence. The, the market, very few software projects and open source software projects are done for love, for free, with no money, no commercial involvement. In most cases, there will be companies involved paying people to get involved. And if you're thinking about your business then and picking a, a particular software project to get involved in, then there's certainly going to be money from you. Um, if you're the only company which is paying people to work on a project and everyone else is explicitly not corporate affiliated, then there's going to be a, a mismatch and some jarring motion as you try and fit together. So you may have issues with that. Or if it's a project with one company that pays most of the developers, it's going to be a very different experience to if it's a, a typical Apache project with four, five, six, seven different companies all in there. Um, if there is money floating around, then that can pay for developers who can make the project better. It can pay for user support, can pay people to do the kinds of stuff that a lot of open source projects don't like doing, like the documentation and the bug triage and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it, it's often good if there's a healthy commercial ecosystem, but it's not required. If you're going to be picking a very small project, you know, it's, it's maybe not a big deal. If it's a very large project that you're going to base the whole of your business on and other people base it on, it starts becoming more important. So we have to think about these topics. We have to think about how they impact us. And then from that, we can, we can work out if, it's going to, if a particular project is going to be a good fit for us, not on the technical side, but on the other side. So we've got a bit of time now. We've not had really any questions so far. So does anyone want to either ask questions about evaluating projects or share their experiences of having got involved in a project and how they've got on with that or picking a project, not picking a project? Is that a question there? Come on. So who of you here has uh, gone through the incubator? Um, maybe you want to share some of your experiences and uh, compare that to how um, other involvement in open source projects uh, compares? So Flex might be an interesting case. Do you want to give us a, a couple of minutes on um, Flex and maybe also how things have changed with Flex as it's gone through the process? Okay, uh, Flex is slightly unusual as a, uh, an Apache project in that it actually came to Apache sort of fully formed. It had uh, a, a long history, it had already been actively developed by a commercial company for about eight years. Um, so the incubator process was quite a long process. It took about a year before we came at a top level project. Um, and a lot that's of the... That's not long. That's not long? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a short one. <laughs> uh, well, it seemed very long, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of that was or around actually getting the code clean into a state where it was, you know, we all... 100% legally sure that it was code that could be donated. And while that was all happening, um, the community built up around that. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a, uh, I actually enjoy working with Apache Flex at the moment. It has a really good, vibrant community behind it. Uh, it the community's quite diverse. There, there are definitely people who disagree with each other and think it should go in other directions, but you know, a part of the Apache way is that that, that all works itself out. How's it been with the, the change from Adobe being the kind of masters of it to being one of a number of people in the community? I think that's had a positive impact on the, on the, on the project as a whole. As again, it, the project is now more diverse. They have uh, a lot more people have uh, new and interesting ideas of what that can be done with Flex and what directions it can go on. And, and some of them are working on that. 
Okay, anyone got any questions? Or anyone want to share a different project? I just have a question. Uh, you guys spoke about um, making sure that as projects move through the process that they're clean. Can you articulate what the ASF does or the process that's done to ensure that? I think someone else would be better. So uh, the ASF takes a pragmatic legal view of IP cleanliness, um, as opposed to some people's lawyers who think that one misplaced bite might reduce and result in a legal, legal catastrophe. So the hard part of it is significant contributions, large bodies of code that clearly came from someplace else. So when one of those is contributed, the foundation requires the authors of the copyright, the owners of the copyright to sign off on a software grant. The software grants come in through two kinds of paperwork, a thing called a corporate contributor license agreement and another thing called a software grant agreement, the difference we need not detain us today. Um, and when that happens, a, a tarball shows up and it accompanies the signed agreement and an MD5 of the tarball shows up and all of the stuff is recorded in a file in subversion where anybody can find it ever afterwards. Now, only after all that sort of paperwork is done does it get unpacked and checked into Apache Git or subversion, at which point things happen like other people's copyright notices and headers being shuffled into a separate notices file and the Apache header being put all over the place. Now, for anything that isn't a great big fat contribution like this, the foundation operates on the principle that people who've signed individual contributor license agreements are going to do the right thing and contribute code which is actually theirs to contribute. And the theory being that both the foundation and people who use the foundation's products can say, look, they signed this agreement. You know, you, we may not, you know, maybe there's a mistake here, but you can't tell us we were intentionally, that we had any sort of malicious intent in using this code. Oh, and you know, I guess the one other piece of that, and then it looks like there's a follow-up is, and then once things are up and running, it is the responsibility of PMCs to be paying attention. Now, paying attention does not mean that the foundation hires black duck at giant cost to watch every line of source code. It means that PMC members watch commits and look for, you know, sort of obvious gross uh, uh, mistakes in terms of what gets checked in. Mm. Um, it seems like most of the stuff that I've caught has been um, not code that's contributed. Um, it's stuff in the lib directories that's uh, ha, ha, ha. tendencies. Okay. Because there are sometimes, you know, jars effectively a zip file and they can contain other zips. And inside those little zips, you find GPL licenses sometimes. So <laughs> you've just. Um, played the tune of some of the oldest and crankiest Apache members in trying to keep the rest of us under control. So an Apache release officially is a pile of source code, period, full stop, end of discussion. If you download from Apache anything that isn't a pile of source code, you're getting a what we call a convenience binary. And while we try really, really hard to make sure that convenience binaries are what they say they are and contain what they say they do, well, you know, human beings make mistakes, and that's how the phenomena you're describing happen. Okay. Anyone got any more questions for us? Anything you want to kind of know about with these projects and deciding on them? Do you all know about the different types of licenses? Because I kind of skipped over a little bit the some of the, the, the license stuff, probably more so one of the earlier slides. So, but when I when I talked about um, whether it's a license that you can take your toys and go home or a license that mandates certain sharing of changes, do you all understand? what that stuff is. <laughs> Someone over here wants to say, no. 
So who, who can give us a kind of five minute primer on licenses? One of the members? Come on. No, no, I'm not asking for a kind of legal opinion, just a kind of couple of minute quick intro. Uh, the Apache license is nearly a universal donor, so it goes with most stuff. <laughs> it, it's hard though, because it does depend on what you're trying to do. So it, whether or not something is, is going to be compatible for a change that you're making within your organization that you'll never distribute is very different from the rules if you're going to be uh, trying to sell it, trying to distribute it to lots of different people. Noreen, I think you've got the, something. The other big problem with creating a compatibility matrix or anything along those lines, as Luke told us in the keynote this morning, quite a lot of the language that we have in our open source licenses, particularly in the licenses that require resharing, uh, is completely untested. Uh, and that which is tested is often tested in only one or perhaps two jurisdictions. And of course, the laws are different in different places. Um, so what's compatible in one place may not be compatible in others. Uh, in terms of a, a, a quick thing on compatibility, so the Apache license can be combined with a large number of other licenses, but generally it's the other licenses terms that will come to dominate. So you can take an Apache licensed piece of code and some code under the GPL v3 and combine them without any problems at all. However, you will now be distributing something largely under the terms of the GPL v3 and not under the terms of the Apache license, which is why we have quite strict rules within the foundation about what licenses the dependencies are allowed to be under because we want you to be able to take our software and say this is under the Apache license and the whole bundle will continue to largely be under the Apache license, rather than saying, well, these 20 pages of code here are under the Apache license, but when you then combine everything else in, suddenly, surprise, it's different. <laughs> so, I, I'm daunted by the question of, can anyone provide a primer to all of this? But there are a few basic considerations you can, you can look at. The first question is, what are you trying to do? If you're trying to build some software you're going to use entirely inside your organization, then the only yourself, your organization might be yourself and your cat, or it might be your corporation or whatever, okay? Then the only question you're needing to ask yourself is, what does, does the license let you do that? So there have been licenses that say things like, you know, that, that actually purport to give field of use restrictions a popular sport. You know, you may not use this stuff if you're building a nuclear reactor in your kitchen sink, okay? If on the other hand, you want to deploy a product on a web, deploy software on a website, well now you have a kind of a public profile and some licenses may try to, to, to ask you, okay, are you allowed to do that? They may say, sure, no problem, or they may say, well, not if you're gonna make any money on it. And then the, the, by far the larger case is, are you going to build some piece of software which you distribute to other people that incorporates this stuff under the license? And that's the most common case in which licenses impose additional restrictions. Now, so that's one axis, which is, what do you want to use it for? The other license, is, the axis I would state is, who cares? Now, speaking from personal experience, here I am, I'm the CTO of a company that makes <clears throat> proprietary software we sell under a license, and we incorporate a certain amount of Apache code in the process. What do we care about? We care about what our customers care about. Our customers are, we're not that big of a company. Our customers have a lot more lawyers than we do. So when our customers come to us and say, if you mention the letters G, P, and L, we're gonna have to break out the steaks and garlic, okay, because we're afraid of the vampires, mind you, I don't have any objection to the GPL, I'm just saying what these people say, then that's a pretty strong reason not to go there. So in a sense, these compatibility matrices sometimes don't really matter, and the analysis of people like Nick and I don't matter, because you have to understand in not only what's your legal risk that a copyright owner might come after you, but are you trying to sell something to someone who cares about this, and what do they think? Can we get you, up to the, <laughs> get, get you up to the mic and then we've got the audio recorded? Um, you might want to stay up there. Um, 
<laughs> so um, I, it's my perspective that um, if you look at software as a stack, you know, operating system, middleware, tooling, that there seems to be a bit of a cultural divide uh, with licensing, and that on the operating, it's largely GPL, LGPL. Middleware, by and large, the successful middleware projects that are still around today are Apache licensed, and I think tooling's still got to be determined, but it's either Eclipse or Apache. Why do you think that is the case? Or well, if it is even the case. Well, I personally am a strong believer in historical contingency here, okay? So in about 1988, 81, 82, I was a student at MIT, and Richard Stallman was sloshing around there trying to, well, I won't say what he was trying to do, but he was often visible in coffee shops with a penny whistle, and, uh, and, and starting the set of activities which became the Free Software Foundation. And his extensive activity brought us GCC and brought us a set of activities that eventually led to the Linux kernel. And that was sort of contagious, right? That was a set, you know, the GCC was the fundamental tool, which grew into the whole GNU compiler suite. And so as a result, that sort of kind of produced a meta community that produced a lot of the things you're talking about. So that's my personal opinion. Someone else in the room may have a different one. Different licenses support different business models. And I think if you look at the kind of the, the ways that people are making money off of some of the OS stack and the way that people are kind of making money off a lot of the middleware stack. Now, chicken and egg, you know, they, they do kind of tie in with the kind of business models that work well with their licenses. I don't know whether, was it the license? Was it the, the company? Was it a sort of coalescing and the ones that didn't fit died out? Could be interesting to look at. But I think you do kind of see things like that and you have to think about if you're going to be using some of this software, you know, what are you going to be building your business on? How are you going to be making the money? And if you're going to be using things like the GPL, that has a whole avenue of ways that you can make money from it. But are they going to be compatible with your business model, with your sales model, with your kind of revenue projections and all that kind of stuff? And if it is, that's going to be fine. But if you've got a business model that needs to fit into, or that works well with an Apache license, and then you start including GPL software, which has a different set of business models that work well with it, it may not fit and it may cause you a lot of problems. Anyone else want to weigh in? Do you all want to go and have, I don't know if you spotted, but in the break room they got M&Ms. <laughs> 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 so maybe that's going to be what you're all after. Any, any last comments, anything? We've got about a minute left. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank